everybody. I'd like to bring to order the September 4th special study session. Uh, Anthony, can we do the roll call? Yes, we can. Councilmember Holland. Councilmember DeGolia. Yep. Councilmember Widmer. Yep. Vice Mayor Lewis. Hello, here. And Mayor Hawkins Van Wallian. I'm here. Thank you. Okay, so the first, uh, we have two items today. Do we have, uh, all right, as a special meeting, public comment is limited to items on the agenda. Speakers are limited to three minutes. Does anyone have a public comment they'd like to make? Anyone online, Anthony? I'll check online briefly. Sorry, I'm going fast because I've been told we have to be out of six. I don't see anybody online. Okay, and nobody here. So, so action item number one, receive an update and provide feedback on the, sorry, Alameda de los Pocas Atherton Ave roundabout analysis. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. So Robert, you wanna take over? Sorry. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. I'm going to provide a brief background as you all are aware we received a grant from uh, supported by Congresswoman Eshoo's office for the improvement of traffic and safety along the Alameda de los Bogus corridor. Uh, that is a corridor that was highlighted in a couple of analysis that the town did in terms of um, where uh, safety and other improvements could uh, be effective uh, in the town and the Alameda corridor was one of the high priority areas. Um, and within that were recommendations to uh, relocate the mid block uh, crossing uh, that's between Mills and Camino Alago to the Camino Alago intersection next to Las Lamitas Elementary School, as well as to put in a uh, traffic signal at the Alameda Atherton intersection. Um, at the time, the analysis indicated that a roundabout would be effective at traffic, resolving traffic issues. However, uh, right of way and constraints in the intersection were a concern. So the ultimate recommendation was the traffic signal. Um, as we initiated a design contract for the overall improvements to Alameda de los Pulgas, the council asked us to take a look at the feasibility of installing a roundabout at the intersection. And that's why we're here tonight. The feasibility analysis is complete. Um, and we're here asking for your feedback as to how you'd like to proceed on the overall project. Uh, the project is currently, the project design is currently proceeding with the traffic signal at the intersection. Um, if we decide to go the route of a roundabout, we would um, reach out to our design consultant, have them give us a proposal for the modifications. We would also have to look to our, um, look to Caltrans and uh, the grant authorities to make sure that there's no issue in terms of switching what that scope is. But that's something that we can manage uh, uh, through staff and the design team. So with that, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on Alameda Dos Pulgas. Uh, we'll go into um, a couple of the exhibits that were included in your package, including the FHWA kind of uh, the MUTC guide on just general roundabout configuration. And then we'll go into the roundabout study and what the configuration is that's proposed um, for your review and feedback. And so as you know, Alameda de los Pulgas is a uh, pretty heavily traveled road. Um, there's approximately uh, 16,500 to 17,000 cars a day that traverse it. Um, traffic is heaviest going southbound in the morning uh, from Woodside Road into Menlo Park and then the reverse in the evening. Um, and so there's about 8,200 cars going one way, 8,500 cars going the other way. Um, and so that's the overall thing and the peak travel, Peak traffic demand is uh, is around uh, the regular morning peak, again, going southbound, the afternoon peak going northbound, and then there's the school peak with traffic going towards the school. Um, currently, the level of service is basically failed. It's a stop-controlled intersection. 
And so there are vehicles that are waiting extensive periods of time at the stop sign, particularly during those commute hours. And so uh, I was out there a couple of weeks ago in the afternoon and the backup at the intersection from Alameda went pretty much almost to the edge of Las Lomitas. Um, we've gotten complaints in the past and it was born through some of the other outreach efforts that we've had that particularly in the afternoon peak, what'll happen is, is people will come down Alameda, they'll see the backup, they'll turn right on Camino Alago, they'll turn left on Fairview or one of the vistas, go over to Atherton Avenue and depending on the direction that they're going, they may even go back right on Alameda to get to the intersection, bypassing the traffic and continuing southbound on uh, Alameda towards Woodside, or they'll just turn right on Atherton and head down towards El Camino. So in the morning, what you'll have is people seeing the backup and turning on Polimus or Stockbridge and migrating their way through town. So the intent of those studies was to figure out a way to keep traffic that's supposed to be on Alameda on Alameda without cutting through different areas. And so the initial analysis bore that by either the traffic signal or the roundabout would be able to relieve that issue, meaning traffic would be able to keep keep moving without extensive delays that would cause that kind of cut through traffic. Um, keeping traffic on Alameda moving. Well, yeah, about 85% of the traffic on Alameda is going from Redwood City to Mendel Park or vice versa. Um, so with that, I'll, Anthony, can you put up the first slide, the MUTCD layout? And so attached in your package was an exhibit pulled from the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And so I'm just going to run through it briefly to kind of give an orientation of different components. Um, and thanks, Anthony. So... Um, the first thing is the, the middle, which is the central island. Um, and that is something that can be uh, painted, fixed, mountable, not mountable, depending on uh, sizing and desired configurations. A lot of places will have it um, raised a little bit, paved over. Other places will landscape it, et cetera. Yes, sir. Robert, before you go on, just with respect to this drawing, this is the MUTCD's example of various legs of a roundabout and how a jurisdiction can address issues. Because you, as you see there, Here's not the all of them have uh, the islands, not all of them have the striping, not all of them have the green bikeways, not all of them have everything at all four corners. So it's just an example of different ways to configure it at each particular leg. And we would do that on all four legs. I so you pick up. one and be the same on all the sides? As it could be, or we could do something different on, on each of them. But Robert's just going to go through the different examples of what types of roundabout improvements okay. could be made. So I just, I just as I don't see this particular one in the packet. This was emailed to me by uh, a resident. What I see in my packet is this one. It, it's, it's in there farther back. Okay. It, it should have been attachment page one. There was a page twenty-seven. So I don't. No, I don't have it. Okay. I, I'm just saying, it's not in my packet. Oh, the here it back. is. It is. I have it. Yeah. I have it, Elizabeth. Okay. It's by the picture. Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't on the big have. one. I apologize for my outburst. But it was emailed to me by a resident. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and so the the roundabout, you have the inside circle. Um, then you have your travel lane that circulates the traffic. And then you have your approach legs. And as George indicated, this here shows several different examples uh, of the splitter islands as you approach the intersection. It's important to divert the traffic 
over to the right so that they start in the direction of the circle and <laughs> gear them away from trying to make a left at the circle. Um, and so you have that splitter island and in the configuration that we have for the concept for the intersection, they are raised, but there are options for uh, striped or um, mountable surfaces um, or fully raised islands. Yes, sir. Crosswalks also going to have those flashing blue things. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So this again is just uh, not Yeah, this here is just an outline of a general configuration, and there are different components that are highlighted. What you'll notice in the traffic uh, circle that goes around the central island, it is marked with sharrows, which accommodates the bike movement through the circle. Um, approaching the intersection in this configuration on both, I'll call it the right side and the top of the page, you have bike lanes on the roadway. Um, and there's a merge point where folks that are wanting to go around the circle, merge into traffic, go around the circle. Those that want to basically make a right-hand turn mm. are able to just basically bypass, go up on a shared use path, and directly down into the bike lane on that leg of the intersection. So I have a question about that. Yeah. Where the bike ramps would enable the cyclists to leave the lane of traffic and go on the shared use path, is the uh, light green structure uh, on either side of the bike ramp, a raised or curb or um, or painted. Or could I, I think it's those? illustrative because some places have parkways along the side of the road. Other places have other things. And in our exhibit, we don't have that area. It's just marked as the sidewalk area um, or shared use pathway. So, and so, so the, the green thing that curves around the border. Is just yeah. a border. Yeah, that is just yeah, a border. Just it, it doesn't. It's not a curb necessarily. It, it doesn't have to be curbed. But in this illustration, the shared use path is at a different elevation from the roadway, and so you actually have a ramp up. That doesn't from, need to be at a different elevation than the roadway. Typically, your sidewalks are vertically separated. Um, They're the gray. That's that, the gray. Is that shared border. use path of sidewalk? It's a shared use for bicycles and pedestrians. But is it a, is, is it contemplated to be a concrete sidewalk? In ours? Uh -huh. Yeah. That's going to be a, at the pleasure of the council. It could be asphalt. <laughs> it could be concrete. It could be something. Um, and so what this shows is being able to take those cyclists that are one, not comfortable going around the roundabout, giving them an easier pathway, particularly for that right turn movement, they can continue on and cross at a crosswalk. And so each leg has a crosswalk that would be ADA compliant. Um, and it's recommended that there's lighting around those crosswalks at the intersection. And there is the option as council member Widmer mentioned of putting RFBs and you would probably do, if you're going to do that, you're probably going to do that on those heavier traffic streets. So for example, you would likely, if you're going to do it, put it on the crossing of Alameda, but on the east leg of Atherton Avenue, there's not really that many, the pedestrian traffic isn't really that, sorry, the vehicular traffic that's going across that leg isn't, as high as it is on the other leg, so you don't necessarily need to put in an RRFB there. Yes, sir. So there's a, there's a lot of bike clubs, you know, and they ride as groups, and they ride all the time, and they're not going to get off. They're no, gonna they're going to no, they're going to continue the through the. So, and yeah. I think that you're going to have cars exiting at the same time. It 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 can be dangerous, and I think. <laughs> 
if there's heavy traffic coming in, and I don't know what the breakdown is of the traffic coming in off of Alameda onto Atherton Ave, for example, where there's also mm -hmm. a lot of bike traffic. Um, if you don't have a, some sort of stop there, even if they want to use the crosswalk, they're not going to get across to the new people. Um, the same as I've made the point on the roundabout, if you're on Atherton Ave and you want to get out, you always have to look to your left to see whether or not there's a car there. And if we have 85% of the traffic coming down south or north, they're never going to get on, on the traffic circle. They're going to be sitting there. So. The other thing I, I had a question on, there were in your pack, you had multiple different sizes and classifications of uh, roundabouts. Uh, you know, there were two that were one lane. One was more, more of a compact one that would be smaller, that would possibly fit in here better. I don't know what the situation is, but it, uh, did you, did the, a consultant look at that and make a determination or just said, you know, we should go with the million five implementation? Um, I'm going to say the consultant looked at the different sizing opportunities and we'll get into that as we get into the specifics on the study. But I wanted it before getting into the specifics on what is outlined or proposed for the intersection to kind of go through general layout configuration so everybody's kind of got that base gotcha. standard. And then the other thing I just wanted to show at the bottom of the screen on the one leg, they actually show uh, addition, an additional lane for um, right turns. Um, that is something that was initially looked at for us, um, but we shrunk it down so that it it's not actually required so theoretically that would be the right an extra right turn lane from atherton avenue to alameda going northbound then there is already there a right is turn lane there there is a right turn yeah lane. so um, theoretically looking at this the uh the approach to the intersection that has that right turn lane that you just referred to is east atherton avenue is that it right? could be um, I see. But like I said, it's not something that we're recommending at this point in time. Why? Um, I think that I think the recommendation was is number one, we're trying to make this as compact as we can. And number two, um, it adds an additional complication to the intersection. And the does it have a, that would be a two lane entry. It would be a two lane uh, entry. No, I, I, and so it's, it's given where we are and the proclivity for roundabouts and usage, it's something that we felt wasn't necessarily needed for traffic demand. And therefore adding the complication would just be that. Question, so do you, can we ask questions about this or do you want to? Finish your presentation. Yeah, do you want to finish? Your well, if you have questions about general stuff, th that's what this exhibit is for. If you want to delve into the recommendations for the intersection itself, then we'll move on with the presentation. Then you can ask when we bring up that slide. And I also mentioned that Mr. Gary Lauder, who happens to be in Europe where it's midnight, wants to make a public comment. If now is a good time for that? Yeah, maybe. Is that okay? It's it's yeah. your meeting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's do that. Let's accommodate him. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, let me just un, um, try, try to make my video visible. Is it? Um, we have that feature turned off. Your comments, we can hear you fine. Ah, okay, sure. <clears throat> um, so thanks for a moment. Uh, just a couple of things. The um, uh, re regarding the uh, the last point, um, I, I wanted to make the, my points earlier, but since you, I'm just reacting to the last point, if you wanted to add a second lane uh, to for the northbound turn, it seems like Atherton owns a lot of land in that corner, and therefore it could do two lanes just for that uh, quadrant. Um, but uh, the, my main points are, 
bit regarding the size. Um, the 90 foot diameter is just large enough to create issues um, with em requiring eminent domain and um, move moving uh, poles of, and issues like that. Um, so if the size is shrunk to the point where it doesn't have those problems, then that, that would be a benefit. Um, the, uh, uh, the other thing is due to the fact that so much of the land and that uh, quadrant is owned by Atherton, you could shift the whole uh, roundabout in that direction. Um, and I also uh, commend you for pointing out that this the center circle doesn't need to be a circle. It could be an oval or some other shape. And um, just one last comment on the left turn restrictions for the southbound AM um, along Alameda. Uh, I, th those are going. That's going to create cut through traffic on Atherton Avenue, or I shouldn't say call it cut through traffic. It'll create more traffic on Atherton Avenue, causing a greater backup at that traffic light, inconveniencing residents of Atherton Avenue. And I don't. I, I, it's unclear to me why um, residents on Polhemus and uh, and so forth should be advantaged over uh, Atherton Avenue residents. And it, it seems that the, the traffic the traffic ought to be uh, unrestricted. Um, and uh, and lastly, um, uh, the safety of roundabouts um, is dramatically higher than that of traffic lights. And I think that safety should be an important consideration for whatever decisions get made. That's it. Thank you for your time. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Robert, you want to pick back up? Hmm? You want to pick back up? I just want to give him since he's in sure. some other time zone. Okay. Uh, were there any more questions about the general configuration components of the roundabout? I do have one question on the right-hand turn. We currently have that, and that's that lamb chop thing that we have to the right. If we took that out, do we have a feel of how much backup that would create on that street for those residents? Because that is that's there for a reason right now. Yeah, so I think that I think the analysis said that with the roundabout, it wasn't necessarily needed. Okay. Um, I think we gave you further on the conceptual layout for the traffic signal that did retain a right turn lane. It wasn't a free right, meaning that it wasn't separated. That way it was a squared off intersection with a right turn lane. Um, and that's because those folks that are making the right would have to wait behind those making a left. Whereas in the roundabout, everybody's kind of circling their way through. So it would allow that traffic to flow. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna continue on. Anthony, you can flip over to that other exhibit which shows the roundabout. So I'm gonna preface um, that we do have the consultant team that worked on the feasibility analysis online. Um, there's a representative here, Scott, um, who's overseeing the team, but on the line we have um, Aureli and Herbie who did the nuts and bolts on the analysis. So I'll try and answer some questions by maybe deferring some stuff to them. So um, don't be surprised if I, <laughs> if I pause there. And so um, with that, we're gonna, Anthony, can you zoom in a little bit on that center piece? So as, a, as alluded to by Mr. Louder, the recommendation for what we call the inscribed diameter, and that's basically the edge of the travel lane to the edge of the travel lane on that circle is 90 feet. Um, that is for, uh, based on the team's analysis, optimal for the amount of traffic that we have on the roadway. Again, we have 16 to 17,000 cars a day going on Alameda Avenue. And then the additional cars that are coming in from, coming in and going on to Atherton Avenue. So they felt that that was an optimal diameter. Uh, the travel lane um, being a shared use lane, in this case is recommended at 12 feet. Um, for traffic to get in and go about. The turn is tight for trucks, emergency vehicles, et cetera. 
And so the recommendation is to basically have what they call a truck apron. And so what that is, is you're gonna have a small rolled curb so that it differentiates the travel lane for the regular vehicles. Uh, that truck apron will be about three inches in height, so rolled curb. Paved area, approximately, I think, what is that dimension there? Is that 13 feet wide? Anthony, can you zoom in? I can't. 15, 15 feet wide to facilitate those truck movements and the emergency vehicles. Um, not intended for regular vehicles to drive on. And then inside of that, you have the higher raised island or landscaping or whatever it is that you want to put in there. And that's the 90 feet because you got 90 in the middle of it. Well, the 90 is from edge to edge on that travel lane. The white, oh, right. So right. the white so dotted line, there's a blue dimensional line. Green is 75. Uh, it's less than that. So if you take 90 minus 24, that'll get you the, in the circle for the truck apron. Then you take out another 30 for the... Um, you get 24. 12 and 12. 12 and 12. Okay, so 90 is the edge to edge of the edge of the road. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Can I, yeah. so if if we were to make it tighter, would it be too hard for trucks and emergency vehicles? Well, that's what you have the truck apron for. Right. Wait, but, that, but you've got the space on the inside <laughs> of... The, the red truck. area is... Is where the trucks... Is go. mountable so that the trucks can make the turn. The green have to be that big? Yeah. Does the internal green have to be there? The internal green is whatever surface you want. It's just illustrative. Oh, he's talking about the diameter of the internal green. Does it have Could to be Could it be smaller? Or? Yeah, it can be flat all the way across if you want it. Meaning that you can say that, I'll, I'll pick a color, that that truck apron can be pink concrete if you wanted that whole full island can be just paved over. No, I, no, what, no. what's being asked is yeah. the diameter of the center green area. Yeah. Can that diameter of the center green area be shrunk so that the whole circle go away? Oh, I'm going to say that yeah. center green area is a takeaway. It's not a driving factor. The driving factor is how why how big a diameter you want for your regular traffic to go. And that's at 90 foot. So you could they reduce the diameter of the entire possible. roundabout. I mean, many roundabouts are 45 feet to 90 feet. This is at the max. This is between a mini and a compact, right? It's right on well, the Well, I'm going to say that this is the traffic, and I'm going to, in a second, I'm going to defer to my experts, is that the traffic volume is too high for a mini or the smaller minis. And so the recommendation is... Got it. A 90 foot diameter. It. And volume. so it's driven by how much traffic we have. And their um, recommendation based on safe mobility and to a degree having enough gap at the entry points to allow, for example, Atherton Avenue to get on. If it's smaller, then the vehicles that are going straight on. Alameda are having a shorter route mm -hmm. and not creating enough of a gap. And so those are the considerations that they put into. Um, if you have further questions on it, I'm going to defer. I have one quick one. Yeah. The fire department, do they provide us with requirements of what that apron and what their turn radius is based on the actual trucks that we have in our community? We would certainly check with them, but again, it's a mount, It's intended to be mountable for them so that they can drive over the red area to make that turn. Do they define what that red area should be? Do they have criteria? I know they do for speed bumps, and I know they do for I don't know other that they traffic have things. I don't know that they have direct criteria, but we would obviously run our design through them to make sure that it wasn't a problem. Yeah, okay. And we could, we could, I mean, the design can, <laughs> if we move forward with final design, the designer <laughs> would have to overlay truck templates to make sure that things were, were sized. And what theoretically that would mean as to your question about that green area, that green area may shrink with more paving to allow for that tighter turn. Yeah, 
I think I think it'd be imperative to talk to the fire district because the old chief, well, it just seems it's not the not the current chief, who seems to be a, have a different opinion on a lot of things. But the old chief, that's beautiful, George. Had sure only that. wanted low, low um, uh, speed bumps and ones that had those holes cut in the middle of them so their wheels mm -hmm. go through without hitting the bump because he said hitting the bump wrecks their their transmission, not their transmission, but their uh, their axle system. Yeah. So I would I would just check with yeah. maybe John or somebody like that mm -hmm. up there because he did make a big deal about it, but I don't know where the new chief is. He seems to be different. I'm surprised we haven't passed this by them just as a courtesy before bringing it to us to take a look at and evaluate because if they're going to say no, this won't go, then we've just wasted all this time. Personally, <laughs> uh, I'm going to say we'll, we'll double check, <laughs> but I don't think that they would say no. Okay. 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 Um, George has a lovely picture of a roundabout on his uh, screen. Anthony, if you can let uh, George can share that for a second. Is that what's up there? Coming up on one. That's us. Hey. <laughs> you know, this is a roundabout. Pretty much designed like we're thinking about that. Uh, it's at the uh, Marin County Civic Center, uh -huh. and it's about mm -hmm. the same width. And mm -hmm. it's got, as you can see, the splitter islands, the crosswalk, various sizes of splitter islands, bike ramp that goes off and around to the side. And so I'll go to the first one in here. It looks like it's not a mini. It's about our size. It's only about 90 feet wide each way. And how so how, how much traffic way. is there? There's not a whole lot of traffic. <laughs> It goes through there, except on Saturdays and Sundays when they have farmers markets and such. The county so fair is quite busy, uh, but you can see the it's a single lane roundabout, uh, and it's got splitter islands, the crosswalks. It's got uh, as you come along this way, flip around. You can see the uh, bicycle lane coming along to the side and the ramp off. To the side that allows them to go on the outside of the roundabout. It's got the little center section that's green and it's got the truck apron with a small raised curb there. I will say when I was at the farmer's market last, uh, it was quite busy and someone came into the roundabout, decided that it was going to be like the Arc de Triomphe or something and was just going to circle around it because <laughs> they used the truck apron as a lane. I believed it was a lane up on it. <laughs> got stuck on it because the other cars didn't allow to get back into the lane of travel. <laughs> so people still don't know how to use roundabouts that well. Yeah. And the truck apron <laughs> simply was a lane. So it really was just a well on a, on a normal roundabout. Mm -hmm. A real roundabout in Europe that you go to the center lane if you're not turning right and you're going mm -hmm. right. You're, you're yeah. So that may have been a European guy <laughs> that decided, okay, I'm going to go in because I want to turn right later on. Could have been. Could have been. Anthony, you can have the screen back. Yeah. Thank you. That's useful. Okay. Seeing um, and so, though it is drawn as a full circle, there are opportunities during final design to make adjustments and make it a little oblong versus completely round to kind of bring things in a little bit. Um, at this point, the consultant team thinks that it, it it can fit within the existing right of way. There are impacts to frontage improvements and other things within the right of way, as illustrated in a couple of your in another one of your attachments that shows kind of what the frontages look like. There's a um, transmission uh, utility pole right in front of I think it's 302 um, Atherton Avenue, and then in front of 297 Atherton. There's some communication facilities that would need to be relocated to accommodate. But I have a question. Mm -hmm. So you said it could be considered to be more oblong than round. Uh, this obviously isn't. But we do have the northwest uh, corner of the property yeah. mm -hmm. as Atherton, town yes. of Atherton property. 
And if we made that roundabout, if, if we essentially got rid of the middle green, which I don't think we need, and we made the roundabout more oblong going toward you moving into some of that property that's at the town of Atherton property, um, it seems to me that we may be able to avoid the conflict with either of those uh, the pole or the AT and T. So I think, and I'll defer in a second. I think that the adjustments on moving wouldn't be sufficient. I don't think you'd be able to do it sufficiently to completely avoid those things. Well, the other, the other aspect is, as you I mean, move, if, if you make it oblong and you go into that space that right now the right turn lane from Atherton Avenue goes on to Alameda. So the, the considerations are as you move that, you have to adjust the approaches of Atherton Avenue and Alameda to bring it to wherever that circle is. And so as you move that, you're going to be moving the approaching roadways to accommodate yeah. that. Yeah which could have <laughs> greater, have other impacts and other things. Like that utilities. Um, yeah, but to, I'm gonna say to bypass both of those, you're talking about a significant adjustment That's because <laughs> the pole on Atherton Avenue, you'd have to shift the intersection to the east to avoid that. Yeah. And then in addition to that, you'll have to shift it over to the um, to the north to try and avoid the other things. And as you do that, you're kind of True. making that's where we have property. Can you point to where the property is that we own? He, he's talking about that area. So that that's the area we own. And where is this, the uh, pole, the utility pole? It's on the other side. And then those little boxes are over there. So there's nothing in our area. The red line is the property line. Approximate, the red line yeah. above is a property line? For the yeah. homeowners. Yeah, the red line is the approximate property line. So everything and so you'll see that the back edge of the <laughs> joint use path pretty much butts up right against that you property You can see line. the property line on the on, yeah. on the northwest corner is active. We, we, we own a big piece yeah, of Yeah, we own a lot of, and the same with the other corner has the yeah. coffee stand out. No, but there's all kinds of there, there's all kinds of uh, cable and other yeah. uh, AT&T mm -hmm. stuff on that uh, southwest yeah. corner. That I think it's on private property. This is interesting. But there's a bunch of stuff over there. I know it. But there's nothing. That, I don't know what's underground. Uh, there could be utility problems there. But but we own a big. You can just look no, at no, it. We, we own land. The, the issue isn't land. It's just as you move that and. Herbie, I think you're, you're on the line, maybe you can interject, is as that moves, the entire approaches, both on the Atherton Avenue side and the Alameda is going to shift. So you're gonna be shifting one way away from properties and another way into properties. Yeah, but it's into our property. No, I'm, I'm suggesting that, it, that 302 potentially could be impacted by how much you shift the approach on the east, on the west leg of Atherton Avenue. If I so can, I, I, don't, I don't know. It hasn't really been analyzed to shift it that much. Um, Herbie, do you want to interject? Yeah, yeah let's let, let that uh, um, uh, Aurelia answer that question. Go, go. go yeah, ahead. can you hear me? Yeah. Um. So yeah. So, um, I think Robert was trying to explain. If you move one aspect, it creates a ripple effect to all of the other factors of this. So even changing the shape of the of the inner circle and then repositioning it, the islands, the splitter islands, are shaped in a way so that vehicles slow down into a speed of 15 to 25 miles an hour. So um, theoretically, this is like a layout we could use, but if you shift the circle, everything else needs to be changed to accommodate to have certain radiuses so that when vehicles come in and out, they 
enter and exit at certain angles to have certain speeds for safety. And I hope that makes sense. So the other things to keep in mind right now, Atherton Avenue has, I'm sorry, Alameda has a speed limit of 30 miles an hour. Uh, the intent of having the roundabout is that as they come in at stop sign, they're obviously stopping at the roundabout. We need them to slow down to that around 15 to 20 miles an hour speed. Um, and so part of those turns are intended to get them to slow down as they approach the intersection. Um, the other things that I do want to indicate is that we need to have a real separation between the two directions of traffic as you approach and depart the intersection. In this case, we're showing raised splinter islands. Theoretically, they can be shrunk, um, but there are gonna be impacts to a couple of driveways. Even if you stripe it, you're striping it so that people are not crossing. It's gonna be a stripe double, double, double yellow. And so, for example, the driveway that we have there on the screen from 297 cannot make a left turn. Well, it can't make a left turn with the kind of splitter you've designed. Uh, they are close enough to the, the intersection that I don't think we want them. You, to you've got a, a tail on the splinters that are from every, everything I've seen from the federal uh, roundabout survey that that I got, none of them have splitter tails anywhere near this size. Um, Aureli, um, I don't know how, why how much can we shrink that splitter island, for example, on the um, east leg of Atherton Avenue? Um, so splitter island from where the circular roadway um, out into the lake, it's 50 feet minimum because the crosswalks need to be at least 20 feet to 25 feet away from the circular roadway. And so the splitter islands can be shrinked up to 50 feet minimum. Um, 100 feet is preferred for safety. Um, it helps with the approach speeds with the vehicles for that length, but they could be up to 50 feet wide. I don't understand why you need the splitter island uh in the direction from the crosswalk away. From, I understand why you need it from the crosswalk to the roundabout. That splits the cars, so you, you don't have somebody trying to cut around the roundabout. But the, the splitter island from the crosswalk away from the roundabout, I don't understand why you need those. That just seems like an unneeded expense to me. Uh, it is based off of uh, references yeah. that I have. They are at the end of a report, uh, but 50 feet is the preferred. Sorry, Bill. Can, can you repeat what you just said? Someone was talking. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, uh, the, the dimensions that I get are based on uh, references and reportings done. Uh, these are listed at the end of the feasibility report I provided to Robert. If anyone's interested, these there are public links you could find, but 50 feet is the minimum preferred length of the splitter island. Um, but the splitter can island can be paint. It doesn't have to be raised. Is that correct? That's correct. They could be painted or well, raised. That's not an issue with the driveway. Yeah. Oh, like I say, like I said, it can be paint. Wait, I don't but understand why you need a splitter island away from the. <laughs> you, you need to. I'm going to say there's a couple of things. One is you want to have cars moving away from that pedestrian refuge where the pedestrians are gonna wait in between crossing the two directions of traffic. And so that's that peach pad area in between. So- There's no pedestrian refuge needed on Atherton Avenue. You don't have any, I mean, there's hardly anybody crossing Atherton Avenue. There might be people crossing Alameda, I get that. You know, you have enough cars on Alameda that you need to be concerned with making sure that the pedestrians are protected, but on Atherton Avenue. But we're pushing bikes. But I, I, I don't, I don't think it's an issue crosswalk. for the driveway if it's a painted surface instead of a raised surface. And I think it's more of a visual um, to slow the cars down as they come to and approach the roundabout, 
with the crosswalk in at that uh, painted crosswalk at that um, area that it's in. So the what began this discussion about a big problem was that there's a driveway that needs to come in and out. Sure. And, and they can't come out and go um, left west. Yeah. In the drawings that you started off with that showed all the different versions of it, okay. at least so two of them are extremely right. short, and one is start. just painted so entirely. Paint the whole thing, you know? So if we opted for the right-hand one, that's just simply painted. Mm -hmm. So that would that would solve this problem, and also would probably financially make a big difference because the numbers that we yeah. have are pretty scary. Uh, I, I'm going to say that my, my first thing is going to be safety over yeah. the, the dollars. And so... Um, my preference where the crosswalk is, I would like it raised around the crosswalk. Okay. Um, beyond that, paint, striping, whatever is fine. But typically those splitter islands are, like I said, if you're going to paint them, they're going to be a double-double for a stretch. And so what that means is, is that a double, a single double, you can make, yeah, I got a cop here. You can make a left turn across. A double-double is the equivalent of a raised island and you're not supposed to make a left turn across. Um, so would you prefer and, of the original chart? You're talking about doing one like the one on the left. Because you showed us a chart that had three different versions of this. Uh, the one. So on, you prefer the yeah. one on the left because that looks like it's raised around the. Um, well, that's that's mountable raised. And so, so but yeah. it, it could be that the splitter island can be shrunk a little bit on Atherton Avenue. Um, but I, like I said, but you the intent the is right. to talk about what the potential impacts are. And so things can be tweaked in the design. This is again, the conceptual layout of what it could, could look like. Okay. Um, and to understand where potential ripple effects might be to help uh, inform a decision and direction to us. If you want us to go over this route and look at shrinking X, Y, or Z, we can kind of kind of look at that. Um, then, sorry, can I just ask? I understand um, that this is a problem. I'm just wondering: like, has there been any thought by the people who know better than we do about urban planning on how to fix this problem? Because that's that's a real problem for that resident there that they can't that really limits their access in and out of their home. So I'm wondering, like, is there like a dotted line? Like, you know, is there a what? like a way to do a dotted area for that? Like what, what are there any options on the table for us? Besides, obviously this one doesn't work for them. So I'm just wondering. But I, I think as it really indicated is that we may be, and as shown in that other exhibit, we may be able to shrink that splitter island a bit. Or even just use a paint because you've got the double striping on it. This other then they can't legally indication. turn left over it. Can I interject well, one make thing? Well, striping then. Right. Change it. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's what I've been asked. Like exactly. they're showing. I'm it just right wondering like if that. there's so there's two options that would work. Yeah, but a couple of them have second driveways that are further away. And you, yeah, I, mean, it's it's not, I, mean, I get. I the, the federal report on curious. roundabouts showed. Uh, Else much should. smaller splitter islands as standard. They, I, I wrote down what it was. I think they showed 14 feet and 10 <clears throat> feet. As you know, so. Can I add MTC some notes? Showed here? multiple examples of what could be. Mm -hmm. your splitter islands with your paint uh, to try and achieve the same result. So, it, yeah, it could be a smaller splitter island with a tail, smaller tail on the other end for the pedestrian refuge. could be just all paint. Uh, so you can provide that sort of direction, but the double-double will still prevent the turning out of the driveway. I, I think if that's untrue. So the California but, you know, Vehicle Code double, double allows people to drive into their driveway. That's good. Can you please repeat that? We didn't hear you. The California Vehicle Code allows vehicles to go across the double yellow lanes to go into driveways. Oh. A single double. Single double yellow. Single double. This is the double. 
if it's a double double yellow like you were saying it's technically a median but for driveways that's an exception for people's homes uh, i don't know if you're dropping copy here um <laughs> I mean, there there are probably ways that we can try and shrink that down and minimize that impact. Um, I don't know. We have one of the residents here, and so I don't know when you want to invite public comment. Um, do you have more to? How do you do? You want to stay orderly, or sh I'm fine with taking questions. We seem to be asking you as we go along. Do you, would you like to make a comment? Would this Sorry. be a good time? Please, do you mind stepping up to the microphone so people can hear you that are on Zoom? It is green. So can you hear me? Okay. Cool. Yes, cool. thank you. Uh, Pavi Ramamurthy, 302 Atherton. So I want to thank all the council members for hearing me out. And uh, Rick, you probably uh, heard a lot from my husband, Prakash, over the last few days mm -hmm. uh, over emails. So I have plenty of things to say about this particular roundabout design and how it will not work for it, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to kind of take a step back and then address it as a resident crossing that road by foot multiple times, taking the car and like, you know, we are four of us and then we have a lot of residents. Admittedly, we are on the um, west facing side, going west on Atherton uh, Ave but we are also, our bedroom faces or is the closest to Alameda. And we hear screeches almost every night, multiple times during the night. So for me, it's a safety. I have a proposal if you are willing to hear it. Um, so safety is an issue. The only road in, in this diagram is the Atherton going east-west, which is straight that you can actually see the stop sign today, okay? Both um, Alameda going uh, north-south curves right after Mandarin and then curves on the other way right after Calado, I think, mm -hmm. okay? So kids driving up and down uh, currently almost like come to a stop, uh, you know, screeching stop at the stop sign with a roundabout and with no raised, I mean, first of all, that um, diameter is very huge. That road is really tiny, right? Atherton Avenue going east becomes much wider, you know, after the 297, I think. But until such, at the intersection, it's it's actually a very, very narrow road. So currently we have a lot of things that are not in place. There are no walk, there are no crosswalks mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we don't have that. On either side, we don't have flashing lights to indicate that there is a stop sign. Mm -hmm. I understand that the intent of this whole study session is to ensure that traffic flows smoothly during those peak hours. And um, I worked from home a majority of the time and I can tell you, you know, yes, that, that is a problem and we can look at innovative ways to solve it. But a roundabout is, uh, especially with no raised platform is going to have people just, you know, use that as a lane that they can drive over. And it's it's not going to help the cause. Um, so my initial uh, comment on this is, we the residents of Atherton and have heard from some of the other residents as well, we are not in favor of anything like, you know, the stop sign works great. And I've seen, I've read the report between 2019 to 2023, there have been two um, I think two incidents, not to say that it's great, but it's it's two, in the, the data points to two incidents. Right. I have a better proposal, uh, which is sh don't do anything, but should you feel the absolute need to do something, a traffic signal at that, at the intersection, without shifting anything, with existing lanes, without needing to move anything at all, with just walkways that operates as a pure traffic signal eight to 10 in the morning or whatever your peak hours is, and as a stop sign, like a flashing red during the better part of the day, solves both problems. And that's something that can be easily configured and it can be dialed up or down depending on 
hey, uh, school just started today, so everyone is running late. So today we're going to run the traffic signal from eight to 11, making it up. But that's mm -hmm. a proposal that I would like, if you really need to do something about it, a roundabout is shifting the, uh, you, you will have to do, A, you have to do significant work to make this work. And B, yes, you will be impacting driveways. And just at the intersection, that plus is a very, very narrow stretch, strip off road. Sorry, yeah, I keep on with transit. Yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to add to that, or you? <clears throat> I mean, I, this is my first council hearing, so I don't know what the protocol is, mm -hmm. um, but I'm happy to answer questions. But we, we walk that road every day. We drive through that road every day. The only, uh, the only positive thing that I would say is Atherton, um, where we are, 302, we are that corner house. That um, road, Atherton going west, that's the one, and according to even the data, that's the one which has the least amount of traffic. People do come and park there and walk up the hill and down. Uh, but all the other three do see traffic, significantly so on Alameda. But this will not fix the problem. I know that for a fact. And in the nighttime, it's going to create havoc, for sure. Especially with cyclists trying to, I mean, I think someone else made a point. With cyclists trying to cross during the day and the cars um, you know, coming down, They'll probably stop, but they're going to end up hitting someone. So thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sorry, Robert. We've kind of gotten total off schedule here. So do, do you have more to what you want to present before I open it up to questions from the council? Uh, no. The only other thing is that you also have an exhibit from, sorry, you also have in your packet an exhibit from the conceptual design for uh, the Alameda project that shows a potential configuration with the traffic signal. Okay. Um, do yeah. you do you want to do any pro con for us of your in your opinion what you recommend? Hmm. I, I think it's better for the council to deliberate right. and kind of all tell right, us. So I'll what, open it to questions. Does anyone on the council have any questions? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, is the million five? Is that in addition to? Um, is that that's the total cost for this versus the light to be paid for by NSU? Is that correct? Uh, the million five is an estimate for the work at this intersection associated with the roundabout. Right. It would be counterbalanced with money that we would have spent for the intersection improvements with the SU project. Our goal would be that if you said you wanted to pursue this, We'll talk to the funding folks to see, to make sure that we can change the scope of the grant instead of putting a signal to put in the roundabout. So, was the grant? so it would be eligible, but it's still more money. So we'd have to. So how much more money is it? I think we said about half a million. Is, is half a million, and th th that doesn't include acquisition of land. It didn't have. I, land, I think but... that our intent is to not acquire land, it would be tweaked in such a manner that we would be maybe at the edges of where the property lines are, but not encroaching into And property. what about the the cost to move the power lines and the communication lines and the timetable for doing that? Um, I think that the estimates include some money for that. The timetable is gonna be a challenge. Okay. What it, did they have to, can you give us a feedback of what kind of feedback you got from PG&E about this? Is this something they're gonna, in the end, say, no, we're not doing it, forget it? Or is this Well, I, I think the way that it works is, for example, we have to make an application for um, power for the intersection, right? So we put in an application, they do their engineering design and They'll come up with estimates of cost. We pay for the, the cost of doing the work. And then they des do final design, estimating, scheduling, all that. The timeline for that, normal power, is not short, but it's not really long. Redesigning their facilities and having them plan out 
where to put, I mean, we'll tell them that they need to be outside of the zone of the roundabout for the poles, but then they're gonna determine where they need poles. Um, and we again would have to reach out to the property owners because the poles are going to move in front of somebody's property. Um, and then um, it requires, once it's estimated, we'll pay however much it costs to do the work. It'll have to be coordinated with our efforts. The poles will have to be moved before we can do any construction. And the same thing with that AT&T box. And to be honest, I didn't check with AT&T to see how long that would take. Um, but those things have to be moved out of the way physically before we can start any sort of construction. So when you- Is that when... true with a signal also? Nope. Because the traffic signal design is laid out in such a manner that, as um, resident said, we're sticking fairly close to what the configuration of the existing roadway is. Anthony, I don't know if you're able to bring up the yeah. last exhibit that was in the staff report. It's called... Uh, it's uh, Traffic Signal Conceptual. Yeah, you had it. It was... Let's see here. <coughs> 35 or 43? I'm hearing page 35 or so. Yep, 35 of the pack. How much do they have to move that pole in order to accommodate this? Is this just a few feet or is it they have to? No, really they it? actually will. I think that in the estimation is that they have to put poles on either side. Mm -hmm. So they so have totally redesigned the, yeah. the pole structure. It's high power, right? High power line? Yep. So it's not a normal line going to somebody's house. Um, so here you have the picture of um, the intersection configured for the traffic signal. You'll see in the lower left corner that transmission pole is behind the sidewalk area. Um, and on the upper right, again, we're staying away. For, it doesn't push things back to where those AT&T cabinets are. This design is accommodative of bike lane on Atherton Avenue because that's where our bicycle pedestrian master plan um, had a bike lane. And so that's what that green area is in the middle there between the right lane and the through left. I have a question. Uh, is that, are we adding crosswalks? There's like a empty yep. line. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's got the and it's got the bike lanes for Alameda. Right. I mean, the, there are no crosswalks now. So. Well, you'll see the box, the black. It's not drawn in with all the hatching. Right, but that's what the empty line is. So between crosswalks. the black, here I'll point them out here. So you can see. Uh, for example, this section right here. Yeah. Is crosswalk. That's crosswalk. Yeah. You see the yellow truncated domes indicating where the Okay, and then I had one other question about um, the construction of the roundabout, since it's much more involved than across or doing street lights. How, like, how does that work? I mean, that's going to take over a lot of the street building a roundabout. Would we be deferring traffic during this? construction period or do you do like one side and then the other like how do, it's very complicated <laughs> um i'm not going to disagree with that <laughs> but there's not really a place to divert traffic right and so it would have to be done in a manner that manages the traffic through the intersection and so it could be done theoretically in stages to accommodate that but that's um things that the design team figure out as well as putting in enough language in the specifications to make sure that the contractor is managing traffic. And so it it is likely going to be that the majority of construction activity is going to be outside some of those peak hours, which kind of extends the time frame for construction. Um, but the consequences of working at between eight and nine and four to you know four to five is something that 
you know, it backs up a lot now. You throw in the construction activity in there and it gets to be a little worse. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yes, go ahead. I was. I also, I think Gary wants to make a comment too. So why don't we let you. Uh, no, a just a very quick to what uh, Stacy was asking about. So if, if that intersection does get blocked, even if it is for an hour, two hours while the work is being done, we literally have to go up Atherton West all the way, go to Ridgeview, mm -hmm. then come back up on, um, uh, yeah. uh, Sketcher, no, uh, South. yeah, Fletcher, Fletcher. And, uh, and that might be blocked because of the construction and cars lining up, so it's literally going to, yeah, well, truly, uh, road construction is disruptive, and that is a fact. There's just a fact of life that anything happens, even paving, even yeah. doing the Lloyden um, yeah. sidewalk. Uh, there was traffic backed up, and it's an inconvenience. Okay. But my oh, comment okay. to help respond to in letters that I've received, residents don't think they don't want a roundabout there mm -hmm. because they think it's going to be worse somehow. And uh, like the screeching cars and stuff. You get screeching cars when you come to a stop sign in the middle of the night from these kids which are racing down Alameda and they're, you know, they see the stop sign, they go, ah, screech, screech, screech. The roundabout, as I understand it, and it is very, very successful in many, many parts of uh, the United States uh, right now, as well as, you know, in Europe. And if you ever go to Europe, I mean, it's, they're everywhere. And it creates a more silent movement of vehicles. People aren't screeching to a stop and then gunning to accelerate through the, the, the stop sign. Um, the roundabout people have to get used to it. People can adapt. They just have to learn, you know, how to merge and what it does. And I honestly believe that it will take that traffic jam that is uh, in those peak hours and make a smoother transition and flow uh, along Alameda. And then when there's not so many cars, it will just be kind of normal and people won't be stopping and starting and you know waiting for somebody and maybe having collisions because that's what they do. As far as, um, I, I think this is over-designed and that's what public works in public agencies do because they want to make it as safe as possible. That's what they want. They want to make it as you know safe as possible, but it doesn't have to be this. It's over designed, so that can be that can be handled. As far as the traffic signal, the four way traffic signal, um, it seems kind of easy to pop up a little four way traffic light and do this. But again, for safety and a pedestrian walkway, you have a push button here and a beep beep beep. You may now cross, you may now cross. And that becomes noise pollution as well as light pollution for that intersection. And that's something that none of the residents will want, even though they may think that you can just, you know, like you're suggesting, which sounds reasonable, only have it activated during the peak hours to kind of manage that flow. But if you're gonna put it up there, there's all of this other infrastructure. And so I think this, you know, the most reasonable thing is just leave it as it is. And some people think that, you know, the traffic is only congested uh, for a few, an hour or so in the morning, an hour or so in the evening, and the rest of the time, you know, it's not congested. I, I, I hardly ever go in commute hour traffic, but, and it's never congested to me. But I know people use it as that. As far as cut through traffic in the side streets, uh, during those peak hours, can't we just put, you know, no cut through traffic, little do not, you know, cut through signs. I know that. We should Dan, put that everywhere. I, uh, I know. No, but town, going into to Lindenwood. Atherton, do go, not cut through. Going down <laughs> Oak Grove by, um, 
Menlo Atherton High School, they used to have that all the time. No cut through traffic going from Middlefield, yeah, cutting yeah. through to get over to 101. Lyndon would put that all over the place. They it did. Didn't, it didn't add any value. <laughs> and they're not enforceable. And they're not enforceable. Yeah. Okay. I understand. But I think we should put that under the you know, Atherton <laughs> population, no cut through traffic. I think we should Athertonians put that Athertonians only. The rest of you can No, that would not be right either. But um, I don't know. That's my two cents. <laughs> and I just think that, uh, think you know, uh, it's a problem. People say it's a problem. Do we have to fix the problem? Is it an untenable, unsafe, truly unsafe situation, uh, current uh, the way it is? I know we've got this grant and we've got to use it. It's like use it or lose it, right? Yeah. Is there anything? I mean, we're doing something good in front of Los Lamitas. That's good, but it doesn't take the whole thing. So. All right. Can I ask one question? Is Gary Lauder still on? Because he wanted to have he wanted to make a comment about the Pacific. Mr. Lauder, do you have another comment? PG &E. um, yes. Yes, I, I do. And I appreciate the opportunity. <clears throat> a couple of things. Um, Firstly, with stoplights, you're more likely to have um, honking horns due to gridlock because um, the traffic, if it can't uh, fully continue to flow beyond the intersection, then um, uh, then those cars will back up into the intersection, blocking traffic from then getting through it, and then have you'll have honking horns. And so um, I wouldn't assume that that is a better solution for, for the neighbors. Um, uh, also, uh, PG&E is supposed to absorb the cost of relocation of the poles. So that $100,000 cost should not be borne by the city. But um, frankly, I, I am the moving the um, uh, the roundabout to the northwest or uh, and or shrinking it is much easier than I think has been claimed. Um, the approaches are there's plenty of room to adjust the approaches um, by moving it. And the claim that uh, shrinking you want to keep it that size for safety reasons, well, it's true that it larger would be safer. but if um if the claim is, well, we can't shrink it because it would be less safe, it would if you shrank it um, uh, somewhat, it would still be dramatically safer than traffic lights. And so if that's what the alternative is, keep in mind, traffic lights have 10 times the rate of fatalities. It has four times the rate of injury accidents, and it has approximately double the rate of accidents. So um, you'd have to shrink it a long, long way for it to be um, less safe than a traffic light. Um, and the last comment is that the cost estimate that was presented includes um, uh, uh, approximately $600,000 for sidewalks and ramps. Um, and um, I, I don't know, I haven't seen the, the estimates for the traffic light, but I would wonder whether the comparison being made includes this um, similar expenses for the traffic light. Thank you. And that's for concrete. We don't have to do concrete. Sorry. You have to do the ramps for complete streets. And I, I could add my two cents on the cost for the roundabout, if that helps. Um, so the roundabout is very generous. It is a very generous design and a generous estimation. So just from what we have shown, does it mean that you have to follow through on everything that's presented. You could make, like said previously, you can make tweaks. And so a lot of the cost, about 500,000 is sidewalk, but it's sidewalk up to a hundred feet away from the intersection. That's a lot of sidewalk. Do you want to include all that? Um, this street light that's on the screen right now, it only shows ramps and sidewalks at the intersection. And so, yes, a lot of the cost is going to sidewalks. And of course, like someone mentioned, there's other alternatives for walking paths. And so I just wanted you to, to or wanted you all to take that into account. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Bill. So um, I, I agree with, uh, with both Gary and Elizabeth that uh, a roundabout would keep traffic moving for the most part. So there's not gonna be the screeching of the starting and stopping you know most of the screeching probably is after you stop and then you they, they floor it to get out 
Um, and so it would keep traffic going if it's going to be the same price as the traffic light, then that's, that's a good thing. Maybe we can value engineer it down. I am still concerned about the bikes going through with the traffic, especially during heavy times. Um, having, you know, lived overseas for years and driven through many of these things, bikes and, and roundabouts don't work very well. And I don't like this. It's not going to, people who ride regularly are not going to do this thing about getting off and go pushing the button to go across and then coming back on. They're going to go straight through. Mm -hmm. And cars that are turning off or turning on could hit these bikes. So I think that that is a dangerous part of, of this. Um, whether or not that is superseded by the improvement in the flow of traffic, that's that's uh, not for me to say. Um, my concern primarily is the bike lanes, uh, but I do agree that the, the traffic will flow smoother on a roundabout um, and it poss quite possibly could be quieter. I'm concerned about the turning for the one or two properties that need to come out and turn left on their property and that needs to be worked out before we move forward with this. Um, and then we also need to ensure that the money will be transitioned properly. If not, I'd prefer not to spend an extra million and a half. I think we have other needs that we could spend on. Um, but if Anna's money can be transferred here, then I would support that as well. So thank you. So if, if I could just re remark on one of your remarks, Bill. Which one? Uh, about the bikes and the yeah. uh, unsafe conditions. You know, I think that bikes and cars don't make good friends for the no. most part. <laughs> However, it is a reality yeah. that they are sharing the roads in every situation. And, you know, on the little side streets that don't have, you know, sharrows, uh, on the big streets, uh, we're going to do something good along Valparaiso, I know. But um, if we have it marked, and there's bike sharrows and green, you know, pathways uh, for the bikes. I think it is, it will be safer than you think. Well, and the cars will be going slower. They're going to be going what, 15, 20 miles an hour yeah. around. They're not going to be going 45 miles an hour like they do down Middlefield or Valparaiso. But the, the issue is going to be for the bikes going 180 degrees or going 270 degrees taking a left turn or going straight through the intersection. Other cars are going to be coming off. Exactly. Remember, they're on the outside, okay? So it, it could be a problem. You know, I've seen it be a problem elsewhere and all in heavy traffic especially, and I'm just raising that. I think that that could be dangerous. I'm not saying it doesn't override the benefit of the smoother traffic. I said that you had a great point on the cautious, smoother traffic. Cautious. I agreed with you yeah. on that. I'm just, I've said from the beginning, the bike concerns me, still concerns me. That's it. Don't ride your bike there, okay? Lots of bike people ride down there. They can go yeah. down uh, and go up, you know, cross at the school they, crosswalk. They go down Atherton Ave. There's a big group of bikes that go down Atherton Ave, and then they For take a, a left group, on. They, on... They, can, they take up the road, okay? And cars have to stop, okay? <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, Rick, did you want to make a comment? Let's not debate each thing because we only got 40 minutes left. Uh, I have a question that hasn't been asked, which is how will the move of the street light from Mills to Camino al Lago impact this intersection with either of these uh, solutions? Can you rephrase? Obviously, I'm, I'm concerned because you, the Alameda curves as it goes toward Camino al Lago and you can't see Camino, you can't see the Walsh Road uh, crossing. Mm -hmm. uh, or Camino al Lago. So there's uh, concern about what's going to happen when there's a street light at Camino al Lago and cars <laughs> that are going uh, southbound in the morning are stopped at that intersection, at that light. 
um, when it when it's red, and will they back up all the way to this intersection? Um, I don't believe that they're going to back up all the way to the intersection. Right now in the mornings, there's a significant backup related to the school pick school drop offs. Right. And so there is a large backup now. Right. Well, when kids are crossing the street or cars are coming out, but and yeah. out of the, out of Los Lamitas, but that's not a street light that stops all the traffic for a whatever significant period of time. Uh, has it has it been looked at how much of a backup there would be in the morning southbound traffic when the street light is red? I believe that that was looked at on the corridor study. On which side? On the Alameda corridor study by AMG a few years back where the recommendation was to do that. When the recommendation was to put in a street light. At, yeah, put in the it. traffic signal. I mean, there were uh, a handful of intersections, including Stockbridge. But, uh, and, that's, I would think and, that would have been looked at in connection with the federal grant since they're proposing moving the street light and putting the street light here. Yeah, so with that, they would have coordinated signal timing between the two intersections. So, so the, the, the signal timing between Camino Al Lago, Atherton Avenue, even in, into Woodside, we, that could all be coordinated and that would keep traffic flow moving. And as, what's what's his name, who we always have come to the meetings? Jeff Toonland. Jeff Toonland talks about, he talks about platooning of vehicles. That's what the stoplight does. Platooning. It, it, it creates platoons of vehicles to move through the corridor. And, and as they hit signals, Each of them they keep doing them. that to allow cross traffic to occur. Mm -hmm. With a signal at Camino Al Lago and a roundabout going north, it would allow cars to flow through the signal in a platoon and then keep going through the roundabout. Yeah, that's not Woodside. a problem. The that problem is the problem. other way. The problem is the other way. They flow through the roundabout more quickly than they do now as a stop sign and then potentially hit that signal at Camino Al Lago going the other direction. That could create a backup. If it's a signal at both intersections, they're synchronized and then they platoon through both intersections. Okay, but if there's a roundabout? If there's a roundabout, you could create that backup. Going southbound. Well, what are you recommending? Well, it just depends upon I'm the density of cars, you know, <laughs> but, how much traffic is there. Right. I mean, and at some point, it's going to be gridlock everywhere. There's going I, to be just too many cars. Certain times of day, it could it could back up with either solution. Right. Yep. Uh, okay, I have a question. I think Rick makes a good point, though, because if the it backs up and blocks the roundabout, it stops all that four makes it worse. Right. sides. So how fluid are we with timing that? Not light very. like you, you can't time the light with the roundabout well i mean you could have it happen more frequently or have it be green well, longer like, i'm going to say things... that as part of the analysis on developing that signal timing well, would have to include a review of how far that backup is okay. and the cascading problem. concurrently for example how it should be coordinated with the signal in the county i think it was it at ab is Where the next down. one up but then you have another yeah. complication to that because the ingress and egress out of the school site at Camino Al Lago is not signalized. So when you signalize Camino Al Lago, that's going to allow the vehicles to exit out of the school parking lot during peak school hours and mm -hmm. add more. Yeah, so folks there. there is well, flexibility. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll say this, that there's flexibility in signal timing that you can say, for example, in the morning peak, I want this in the school pickup period, defined hours, meaning that it's not exactly when the school lets out, but you say, for example, between two, between seven and nine, I want it this way, between um, uh, two and three, I want it this way, and then from four, on, four to six, I want it like this, and then the rest of the time, it has kind of a fixed if you, if you guys feel from a traffic flow standpoint that, that the the roundabout will cause more problems, then you should make that recommendation that you don't think it would be appropriate. But 
you know, if, if no, but you're just, if you're just neutral on it. That it can be managed yeah, by it's, yeah, it's, timing it's, the signal. So it should long, be able to manage it very, to a degree. You can have a much shorter signal in the morning when you want, and want to ensure that there's not a backup. Yeah, well, it's I'm going to say one of, long enough signal for kids to cross the street. Well, one of the keys is really going to be the access to the school in the morning. And so I'm not going to say that you know, so there's a backup now and there's no signal. And so there is going to be backup. Yeah, but the issue um, is, will the backup go all the way to Atherton Avenue? That, that's a deal killer. Yeah. I mean, you can't have the backup going all the way to Avenue Avenue. You gotta be able to control that. If you can't control that, you can't do a roundabout. Yeah, I, I guess my, yeah. I don't feel like my first question was answered. So if we put in a roundabout and that light and something goes wrong and we're like, it's been two months and it's bad, what happens? Like, do we have to go to regional state? Like, is this like a year review or is this something that Atherton can like tinker with? Well, it's on our own. Given that the intersection is joint with the county, we would have to coordinate with the county to figure out optimal time. And how, like, how slow is that? Or is that like a quick, like, phone call? Let's tinker on it, something? Or is this like a six month nothing public with the comment? The county is quick. Well, that's what I'm it, saying. It, though, I'm going like, to say it wouldn't be that six month thing, but it's not going to be an overnight thing either. Okay. I mean, it's we realize that there's a problem. We talk to their team. They actually have traffic engineers on staff, actually, that would hopefully help us figure that timing adjustment out. Didn't we have this already where with the lights at one side and the other one right by that other school and that we didn't have control of those and those actually impact the Stockbridge situation? So I was curious on this question before on the other side, if we add that light, does it help the the uh so it's all continuous right all of it's continuous it, it's and continuous change, i'd change. say that the camino alago light has limited impact if any at the other end the real the real controlling factor on that end is the woodside signal which is controlled by caltrans and so they set the timing for that signal the county has the one at hull and so they have to adjust their timing to coordinate with the Woodside intersection. But once you get down to the Atherton, as far down as Atherton Avenue, there there could be some coordination, but it's so far down the stretch that it's it's a pretty Yeah, pretty those big two, I think, affect the Stockbridge, which the roundabout that we proposed there or the Hawk Beacon. But if we add just this light by the school, how much does that affect Atherton Ave? Separate of what we do with this There's corner. a greater likelihood. I mean, I said at the morning peak is probably the worst time of, of how the Camino Lago signal could potentially impact Atherton yeah. Avenue. But what I heard you say was that you can manage the timing of that light. I, I believe so. I'd probably... I'd, Gonna, I'm going to have to digress to the team that's actually doing the design, and that's with uh, Kimley Horn, and so that we can ask them to kind of do a quick analysis on on that, and we can. Your decision can be contingent on whatever that outcome is, if that makes you feel better. Yeah, let but me I ask that question again in a more concrete way. If we did nothing at Atherton Ave but we add this light, which is already in the works to be added. How does that adding that light affect that intersection? Will it make our current problem worse? I don't think so because you're already stopping traffic at Atherton Avenue. Because of the stop sign. You could program so, it. You could program it. Yeah, I mean, it. you have a, st everybody at Atherton Avenue is now stopping, right? So they're stopping, they're gonna go, I, and it's slowing down traffic enough that I don't believe that the signal would make it worse. It would make sure everybody gets an equal. Speed. But what's going to happen is when it goes green, everybody's going to flush out at Camino Alago. This is and going in the direction I wanted to. Do we control the light? Go. One more time. Do we control the light at Camino Alago? Is that? County sure. as well as Atherton? Or so well? right now, the Mills Crossing, it's fully within the county, but it's not a regular light. It's just a pedestrian activated traffic light. Right. When we put in a signal at Camino Alago, 
half the intersection is ours, half belongs to the county. So it is going to be a shared traffic signal. And so we would have to work with them on that signal, similar to what we do with Menlo Park on the shared intersections at um, so, so on Middlefield. So it continue to be what it is right now, actually, if, they, if we made that decision. It could just continue to be a pedestrian-initiated light that's there that enables the kids to cross at their school rather than cross at Mills. No, it's a full traffic signal. At Camino Al Lago, that's proposed. yeah. But you can control when that traffic signal goes on and off. You can't you control it just to, to make it pedestrian initiated. No, well, it's a full traffic light. That's what's proposed as part of this project. So you want it to be a Hawk beacon? Not necessarily. I'm just asking. Oh, okay. So all right. But we, but we up. we can control the timing of that signal and how long. How long the, the different green cycles are? Yeah. Is. yeah, yeah, in collaboration with the county. Right. Yeah. So we've kind of gone off. We've asked questions. We've some of us have made statements. So do, does everyone get their questions answered first? Yeah. There's I have a, a question. You didn't get to make a statement. I'm right. sorry. We are to public comment. I, if I can one more time, but we're we're not supposed to do that. But did you have something you want to say? Uh, just a very quick question uh, clarification really which is with the roundabout um, what is the um, turning radius for wider vehicles especially construction vehicles that are coming in or making a turn um, I think it will limit trucks coming in up the road down, I mean anywhere really to be able to make the turn safely so I think that was a discussion about the apron they were talking about with the raised apron and emergency vehicles so does anybody have Stacey, I haven't heard I, your comments yet. Well, I had actually one more question. Um, I don't, I drive this intersection all the time and I don't remember if we have a lot of flooding issues on that intersection with the roundabout mm -hmm. or a la green infrastructure that we have to do with the roundabout. Mm -hmm. Does that impact? Like, I don't, I don't remember. I We have some places that have flooding signs all the there, time. There's a drainage system at the intersection. Okay. Either project would require some modification to it, move in the catch basins and that kind of thing. And then both projects would require green infrastructure improvements. Yeah, it just seems like the roundabout would give us more chances to add drainage, given how extensive it is, if there's already a flooding problem. But there already is drainage there, it sounds like. Okay. And it would be rent the, the the center part is raised, so the water won't get there. So they would so, like yeah. Go yeah, ahead and design all kinds. This of, just final question for me: it, You didn't show what the cost okay. is uh, included in the Anna Eshu grant for the traffic signal. So I don't know what the comparison is I between so. what I consider a ridiculous one point five million dollars. And whatever the traffic signal cost would be, I don't, I don't know what the difference is. I think yeah, you said that they were the same. You said they were roughly the same when I asked the same question. No, I said it no, was about five hundred thousand dollars. There's a five hundred dollar net difference between the. So there's about a million K. dollars for the traffic signal. Five hundred k. Not Somewhere around there. However, yeah. however, this estimate has about five hundred thousand in concrete for the, yeah, for the, the sidewalks. Block. So yeah. that estimate needs to be pared down. It would, the, okay. the, the cost of the roundabout would be refined by field conditions. It would the, be design, the actual by design. design. It would be refined by direction from the council to let's do some striping versus, yes. you know, let's do some DT versus concrete, uh, gore points. less sidewalks. All of those things would refine no that green estimate. infrastructure. So our I want a well in the middle. So, I, I mean, the reason that we considered a roundabout was because the stop sign and a stop light stops traffic and people are, their automobiles function more efficiently if they're a gas automobile, um, <laughs> as long as they don't have to stop. And when they have to stop and start, it creates more pollution and more noise. So the concept of a roundabout was that it would flow more easily. And those of us that have experienced roundabouts, for me, mostly at Stanford and a little bit elsewhere, is that they work extremely efficiently and cars move easily through them. 
as I see them. Now, I do think there's a learning curve that's required. And I think this intersection is challenged by the fact that you can't see through to Camino Al Lago, but I'm comforted by the information that we could control the signal at Camino Al Lago to ensure that there's not backup, that, which to me would absolutely kill the idea of a roundabout, because if there's backup from Camino Al Lago, forget it, it it's not gonna work, period. Um, I think the estimates that are given to us is like the most heavily designed roundabout you could do, and it's not what I want. And I don't think it's useful for us. Uh, I think we should re have this roundabout be redesigned to no more than something like 60 feet in diameter rather than 90 feet. We should eliminate as much as possible of that center little piece that's really a show, show piece. I don't think we need curbs any more than we have curbs for the traffic signal. Uh, I do think that the concept of enabling bicycles to exit from the roadway and not have to go around the roadway is good because there will be cyclists that would want to exit and cross at the crosswalks, although I agree with Bill that most of the cyclists who are serious cyclists aren't going to do that. But the others should be given that option. I think that's important. Yeah. Um, I don't think that these splitter islands need to be as large as they are, especially the tail that runs down each of the streets. I think you need them from at least from the crosswalks or maybe a little bit before the crosswalks to make sure that you're separating the traffic. And, and to the extent the crosswalks could be moved back from the roundabout, that might be helpful. Um, uh, but I think that the splitter islands uh, away from the from the crosswalk away from the roundabout should all just be painted lines, not raised curbed yeah. islands. Sort of not splitter and, islands. And I, I think Paint. every other cost that can be taken out of this should be taken out of it. I mean, I'd rather rather than spend money on this, it should be cheaper than a signal. Mm. So and. That doesn't address the issue of the disruption. Same. The same price. Which I think will be significant it's in us. any case. Yeah. And, and is unfortunate, but I don't know how to get around it. So, um, so and, and I also think it's a that, that we have to protect the residents that are close to it. If, if you're forcing a resident not to be able to turn left onto Atherton Avenue, that I mean, that's just not acceptable. Before this continued comments, you're... Most of those, I would say, we could probably address. One of them in particular, though, I think you're going to want to rely on the advice of your traffic engineer for vehicle in traffic safety based on the volume of this roadway, and that's the diameter of the roundabout. Yeah. I, I don't think we can say here, yeah. as laypersons, make it 60 feet. Yeah. I think you need to rely on the advice of your traffic engineer well, for that when, diameter. When I read the federal roundabout thing, it said... To make a mini roundabout work, you needed 15,000 cars a day, and that we're a little bit above that. So I, either way, we're all laymen here, yes. so let the traffic engineer give you that recommendation. And then uh, no you have, problem. I agree with that. Yeah, you have you know, some I, design. I also immunity. think <laughs> to the extent, and now I understand it could require some additional cost, so maybe it's not desirable, but to the extent we can move it toward that corner where we own the corner that that would be better so i'd like to give my comments on this um i'm troubled by the fact there are a few things so we've been asked to decide which way do we want to go with this do we want to do the roundabout or do we want to stick with the light and if you look big picture at it roundabouts are safer i buy the statistics on round them being safer them being quieter um i do we have a few things that are uh, our big stops. For example, if PG&E will not move their poles, that's the end. That's that stops the question right there, um, and we don't know the answer to that. I think that originally we were comparing like safety issues. We were comparing price issues. I think the price numbers that we have, we can't really rely on. I heard everyone sound like that's going to be a little closer. That they're more equal in price than what was presented here. So in the end, we have some of these questions that I would wish we knew the answer to before we had to decide. Because if pg &E will not, or for whatever reason say it's not feasible, not possible, that's the end of it. 
In the meantime, we have the clock ticking on being able to go forward with the grant that we have. We also don't know whether or not the monies, the grant monies we have will able to be transferred over to this other project. So if we say, all right, we want to do a roundabout for all the reasons we said before, they're safe or whatever. If they say, no, you can't, we gave you the money for a sign and you have to do the sign, then that's a stop right there. So for me, there's a couple big stop signs that we don't know the answers to. So it's making it hard for me to have a strong opinion one way or another Sorry. without knowing which way those are going to go. Why don't we ask staff to come back with so that? I don't think that um, uh, you can assume or assert, assert that the money can't be transferred to this other uh, traffic safety project. Yeah, we don't know. No, I saying. don't. But I, yeah. but I think that you could potentially assume that it could because yep, it's rational. Don't know. It's reasonable, rational to do that. And um, as far as the telephone pole, I think that in order to get that approval from PG&E, you kind of have to move the project forward a little bit and then, you know, let the guys work their magic and how to do it. PG&E moves poles all the time, okay? Right. And as Mr. Lauder indicated, um, in his understanding that, which is maybe or maybe not, but you never know. You got to ask, yeah, they, right? They'll pay and for it. See if they, yeah. But, you know, I think to say, think no, we're not going to make a decision to kind of move forward on something to continue the project, to continue the process, to flesh it out more and get the fire department's that's the other you know, one. Blessing. That's important. Uh, nope. That was the other point fine. I forgot to say. You know, uh, George says, trust me, it's going to be fine. Whenever a man tells me to trust him, <laughs> I go, <laughs> I, don't know, George. I, don't know. I guess what I'm not saying, to, I'm not saying that this is a no. I'm saying that we should go forward to get the answers to these big questions. And maybe we you, go forward. You have to go get forward those and answers. These answers will and come. then once the answers Let's come, let's not give we... fire protection to that end. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. They can get Woodside to give them. Some and help. I'm sorry if the neighbors feel that that's a a, a, a bad thing because I know the neighbors yeah. don't want to change. Huh? Right. They think they think it's you know they don't want they think it's gonna that. we're gonna make it worse, and. Mm -hmm. You know, so and I am. feel for you about that. And there will be construction disruption. Need to check but out. we've been talking about this for about 10 about years. Changing the structure. <laughs> and it's been analyzed a lot. Can I make a suggestion? Yes, please. Uh, so Robert's got to check in with, with the federal really folks well. about flipping it out between a yeah. stoplight and a roundabout. At that same point, he can also check in on whether there's an opportunity to extend the timeline of the grant mm -hmm. to accommodate that particular change if the council chose to go that route. In the intervening time, we can try and chase down some of these other issues, exactly. maybe refine the design a little bit. Who knows? That's going to be some additional design costs related to that. And it's all a change for the project. Meanwhile, we'll, we'll keep moving forward with the traffic signal just in case we do hit a dead stop because of pg e or because of something else no but if we stop the project's work entirely it's still a change cost either way we're going to end up having the, the contractor who's currently designed in the middle of design of a traffic signal which is what the traffic which is what the original recommendation was oh. that work would stop the whole project work would stop well, you're, we don't you're really want to do that a, until we know there's an extension on the end of the project. And you're saying that there's a chance that we don't get it done in time that the grant said that we would lose that money. But there's, there's always that potential that's with federal grants. If that's, if, right. that's, if that's the situation and, and it's going to take longer to get PG&E and things like that in there, then I think we have to revisit right. it. But, but that's where we're going to chase that. Light in just because there's a grant and just because council several years ago said oh yeah let's do a stoplight you were on it seemed... and you agreed i know <laughs> i i make a mistake you know oh, but i have on. an opportunity now to correct it because Look, you know we'll have to take a vote then but i think that There's staff can find out between now and september about... we'll, we'll be doing outreach i think that what we heard is that the council has a preference of moving forward with a roundabout if these hurdles can be overcome and so one is the issue with the federal grant. Yeah. So um, those are things that we'll be 
trying to flush out over the next couple of weeks. Stacey. I haven't actually weighed in yet. Um, you are correct. I'm more team roundabout than traffic light. And I, one of my reasons for it, which is not something we talked about, is that right now we're addressing a problem of one-way traffic two times a day. And putting a traffic light will slow down traffic for all the other times of the day when there isn't a lot of traffic the other direction of traffic. And I think the roundabout will actually make traffic move faster than a stop sign will for the majority of the day. So I think this is an improvement for like, I turn on to Atherton Avenue all the time and I think now I don't have to stop at a stop sign and that'll speed it up for me. Um, instead of having to stop and wait, it'll be smoother. And I think that's an improvement for a lot of people. Um, I think design-wise, from my perspective, I we absolutely need to figure out the driveway problem. But I do like, my preference would be more towards having green space than paint. So if there's some hybrid here of green space and paint to fix the driveway problem, which is the priority to me. But, you know, a lot of paint is ugly. Like, let's throw some plants in there. It'd be more beautiful. It's Atherton. Throw a tree in the middle of the roundabout or something like that. So... I think from a design perspective, I would like to see it be aesthetically pleasing as well as a solution for a problem for traffic. Agree. I agree that, you know, the green space inside the island should be kind of planted material. You know, yeah. Some some if some places have a sculpture. You yeah, know? something. Or like, thing. Let's you know, make monument. it nice. There's also like between the crosswalk <laughs> and the roundabout, there's those little pork chops. Like those could be green space, you know, like. Yeah, that's just the Let's line. figure it out. We let's try and <laughs> let's try and prioritize having some green here and not just like a technicolored paint bonanza if we can right. do it with plants. Okay, well. So George, that. do you have what you need from us or do you way, need us to actually. Eight corner we own that nothing has done there. during the time. Because we, at one traffic, time it was we could landscape, just have it then, blinking yeah. on Alameda. I, I think yellow. we have enough yellow. direction from and the and council on the item. There will be impacts that we cannot just... remedy. I mean, driveway on one spot, we may be able to remedy driveway on another might be too close to the roundabout we might not be able to remedy that one but we'll bring that information back to you along with the information on the federal timeline and the change out from a signal to a roundabout possibility Easy. you're not going to see that in september that's just too short of an amount of time that would have to but be next week we have too many um so it'll yeah. probably be sometime in october that you get that feedback make it november I don't all right so you have everything you need on this item we have everything i need on that item so when you move to the next item, since we only have 12 minutes, which we don't have enough time for, I suggest we just continue that to a future meeting. All right. Okay. I, I, That's thought okay. I support that. All right. Motion to adjourn. Yes, okay. I second it. All in favor. Aye. 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 Aye.